Hi everyone, this video is part four of the 2B series on memory in the cognition unit for AP Psychology students. This particular video will focus on retrieval. So as you can see on our unit outline, this is the fourth video in our set of five on memory. This video is gonna focus on how memory is picked up after it's been stored in the mind and the different factors that influence memory retrieval. These are the key focus questions for today's video. By the end, you should be able to answer both of them. Here are the vocabulary concepts that will be covered in today's video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So as you already know, the information processing model of memory uses the terms encode, store, and retrieve, and they use these as steps to explain how the mind takes in, holds, and picks up information. And today's video is gonna focus on that final step of retrieval. Now, memory retrieval is the process of accessing information in our mind that's been stored and then bringing it into our conscious awareness. Now the College Board wants AP Psychology students to be familiar with two forms of retrieval. They are recall and recognition. Let's do a quick test to demonstrate these two retrieval methods. On the screen, you should see four different countries. Do they look familiar to you? Without utilizing any tools, I want you to take a moment and see if you can remember their names. If you have a pencil and paper, you can write down your guesses. Now the process you are using, as long as you aren't using any tools, is called recall. So recall is a retrieval method in which you attempt to pull information out of your memory, things that have been stored without any cues or any prompting. So you go back into your mind and you produce that information. So could you do it? Could you recall the names of these four countries? Now let's try again. There's a box at the bottom of the screen and it says, determine the names of the countries pictured above using the names from the list below. Now you have a list of nine country names. Can you identify them now? If you need to, you can update your guesses. This process of memory retrieval is referred to as recognition and you're still using memory retrieval by pulling information out that you've previously stored, but you're utilizing a retrieval cue to help you do it. And a retrieval cue is anything that helps you access information that is stored in your memory. It could be a word, it could be a smell, a sound, or even a feeling that can trigger that memory. So in this example, the word bank may aid your memory retrieval and act as a cue to help you identify the names of each of the countries. So let's check your answers. So this task was an example of the different types of memory retrievals and how cues can help aid the process. So let's review the concepts one more time. Recall is when you retrieve a memory or information from your mind without prompting or cues. Recognition occurs when a retrieval cue helps you identify the information you've previously learned. Now, let's dig a little deeper into some other examples of how retrieval cues can bring memories to mind. There's an idea called the encoding specificity principle, and it's the idea that stimuli or a context that's present when you're encoding information into your mind can actually serve as a cue that can trigger the retrieval of that memory later. Have you ever noticed that when you return to a place that you've been before, a memory you had in that place comes to mind? Like visiting a classroom that you haven't been to in years, and when you walk back through the doors of the classroom again, you might have memories pop into your mind of where you used to sit, or who you interacted with, or a project you completed in that classroom, or even maybe something funny that happened when you were in that class. This ex example or this experience is called context dependent memory and context dependent memory helps us understand how our environment can be a retrieval cue for our memories. One study on context dependent memory was conducted with scuba divers in 1975 and the divers listened to a word list in one of two settings, either underwater or on the beach. And researchers found that the participants recalled more words from the list when they were tested again in the same location that they learned the information, whether it was underwater or on the beach. So therefore, context-dependent memory shows us that the environment or the 
space you are in, can, that while you're encoding that information, can actually act as a retrieval cue to help you pick that information back up later. So if you study in a library, you might actually remember the material better when you're back in that library because the space can act as a retrieval cue. Sometimes our emotional state can act as a retrieval cue. Consider this, have you ever felt really irritated? And then as you're stewing in your irritation, memories of other things that irritate you start to pop into your mind. Or have you ever felt really sad and then in your sadness, you start to think of other things, other memories, sad memories that you have had. Now, these are situations that are examples of mood congruent memory, which is when your emotional state acts as a retrieval cue. The word congruent actually means something that is similar to or the same as or in line with. And so this means that mood congruent memory is when you are in the same or similar mood or emotional state as you were when you encoded that memory, then you're more likely to remember it when you are in that same emotional state again. This influence on memory retrieval is called mood congruent memory. Now, sometimes your internal state, like your physical or mental condition, can act as a retrieval cue, helping you access memories tied to that same state. This is called state dependent memory. And it's similar to mood congruent memory, but a little bit different. Where mood congruent memory is tied to an emotion, state dependent memories can be tied to that physical or uh, mental state. So some examples might be if you are in a state of drowsiness or mental alertness, or if you're under the influence of a substance. So when we learn or experience something in one state, we may have an easier time recalling that information when we're in that same state again. For instance, if you were learning something while you were drinking caffeine and you were feeling highly energized, you might actually recall that information better when you are caffeinated again. This retrieval cue of being in the same mental or physical condition is referred to as state dependent memory. Another quirk of memory retrieval is something called the serial position effect. And the serial position effect refers to the position a piece of, of information falls in a series might influence how well you remember it. So when you are exposed to a long series or list of information, you are more likely to remember the information at the beginning or at the end of the list better than the information in the middle of the list. And this was studied by Glanzer and Kunitz in 1966. And they found that when participants were given a list of words to remember, the results actually fell in a pattern like you can see on, this, on the diagram on the screen. Participants tended to recall the words that were presented at the beginning of the list very well. And this was referred to as the primacy effect. Primacy, if you think of the word primary, these words refer to things at the beginning or first. Primacy effect tells us that we are likely to remember things that we are exposed to first. Participants also typically remembered the words at the end of the list fairly well, and these were the ones that they had just most recently heard, and that was most recently taken into their memory, and so this was referred to as the recency effect. The items at the end of the list were also more easily recalled. So this part of the serial position effect is called the recency effect, and that's when the words, in this case, the words that were recalled at the end of the list were easier for them to retrieve. Now together, the primacy and the recency effect make up the serial position effect. And together, they help us understand that when we're presented with information, the information at the beginning and the end are both usually more easily retrieved than the information in the middle. Now, when it comes to aiding our memory retrieval, cues can be beneficial, but they're not always reliable and they can often be outside of our control. So if you are purposely trying to boost your memory retrieval, research shows that the more times that you practice retrieving a memory, the better you will be at picking up that memory again later. Students often misunderstand this principle because they think just revisiting the information, like rereading the material, or copying down information from one source to another is going to help them prepare for a test.
test. But what researchers have found is that it's not necessarily the act of revisiting information that's most effective, but rather when you revisit the material, you practice retrieving it. This is called the testing effect. And you can see it displayed in the data in the graph on the screen. These results are from a 2006 study on college students, and the participants were given a short prose covering general scientific topics. Then, after they read the material, they were prompted to either take a test over the material or restudy it. Then the students were chosen to take a memory test to see how well they remembered that information, either five minutes, two days, or one week later. And you can see on the graph that the students who took the practice test after reading the prose had better long-term memory of the material than those who just restudied it. This is called the testing effect. And what it means for us is that we need to practice recalling information if we want to effectively retrieve it later. So we need to actually practice retrieving it. So if you're spending hours rereading your notes, this is not as effective as testing yourself on the material. So retrieval practice is what's training your brain to go back and access that information and use it. Now the testing effect and metacognition are closely related because both involve your awareness of your own learning and memory. Metacognition refers to the ability to think about and monitor your own thinking. It includes skills like self-reflection, assessing how well you understand something, and deciding how to adjust your learning strategies. And the testing effect can actually enhance your metacognition because taking practice tests helps you evaluate how well you actually know the material rather than just relying on how familiar the material feels because that can be misleading. You don't know how many times I have heard students tell me, Mrs. McCrary, I just took the test and I remembered learning all of that material. I read the question, but then I couldn't, I couldn't figure out the answer, but I remembered learning it in class. Now, I know that this feels really frustrating. And the problem is that information felt familiar to you. And maybe as you were rereading your notes, you thought to yourself, oh yes, I remember that. But if we're not actually practicing retrieving that information, we might not actually be able to pick it back up later. So when students take practice tests, they're engaging in that retrieval practice, which not only reinforces the memory, but it then provides feedback about what they know and what they need to review. So using testing as a form of studying can actually encourage your metacognitive awareness by giving you a clearer sense of what you know and what you don't know. So metacognition refers to your awareness and your understanding of your own thought processes. So drawing on what you remember about data interpretation and research methods, let's answer two questions using this same graph related to memory retrieval. So question number one says, what psychological concept is depicted in this graph? So utilizing this same graph, let's answer question number two. Which of the following statements accurately describes the data depicted in this graph? Question number three says, John noticed that he does better on his chemistry exams when he takes them in the same seat he sits in during class than when he sits in a different seat. Assuming that John is properly prepared for exams, what psychological concept best explains the difference in his scores? Question number four says, Danny is at a meeting where everyone goes around the table and introduces themselves. By the end, Danny can only remember the names of the last two people who introduced themselves. This is an example of which concept. And finally, question number five says, which of the following involves accessing memory through recognition? So this brings us to the end of today's video on memory retrieval. On the left-hand side of the screen are the answers to the review questions. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you can check your understanding of the essential elements of today's video.